hello friends. Welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the television show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are delighted to have uh, one of our favorite authors on the program <laughs> back with us today. She's back with us after appearing on the first season and the first year of our Chapters episodes, and that author is Sheila Redling. She also writes under the uh, pen name S.G. Redling. And Sheila Redling uh, is a native of Huntington. She's a graduate of Georgetown and uh, she's the author of seven <laughs> novels, and uh, we're going to talk to her about uh, what she's been up to since the last time we had her on the program. And she also is a former uh, morning show host on WKEEFM with J.B. Miller for a number of years, and now she has moved on to writing full time. And we're delighted to have Sheila Redling with us here today. So, Sheila, welcome. Good to have you back. Thank you so much. It's been a long time. Yeah. I haven't. Nothing has changed, though, has it? Uh, no, I don't, no, I don't think so. It's still foolishness behind the camera. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Because we had you on our first season of taping back mm -hmm. in August of 2013. At that time, we talked a lot about Flower Town, which you were, you were writing, and you were also working on The Widow File. So we'll get into some of the things that, that you've been writing since then. But how has the whole writing experience changed, uh, improved since we had that first conversation? You know, I would love to say that I figured out how it works, and I've got a great system, and I've got all the answers for writing a book, but every single book it's like I've never written a book before. I'm no better at it. I don't, I mean, I think I'm a better writer, mm -hmm. but as far as understanding the process or having a system that works, as soon as I think I know how I write a book, it all falls apart and the next one has to be done completely differently. So basically it's gonna be the same interview we had in 2013, <laughs> just with a different title. Just with a different title, yeah. fair enough. I wanted to ask you a little bit, uh, we'll go back to, look, uh, to some of your uh, books in between Flower Town and uh, your newest book first, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, and, and that is At Risk. And, mm -hmm. and we have a, a really interesting uh, storyline developing there. Tell us a little bit about what At Risk is about and, and what's going on in that particular book. At Risk is a departure for me, character-wise, because most of my female leads mm -hmm. are, shall we say, a mess. You know, they're usually substance abuse and anger issues and questionable hygiene. And I wanted to try something different with At Risk. So I have Colleen McElroy, who is this very pulled together, proper, timid, uh, sort of like perfect little society lady. That's what she appears to be on the outside. But the truth is, inside, she's a disaster. She barely escaped her first marriage, which was just brutal and blindsided her and completely uh, undermined everything she knows about herself. And she's trying to rebuild herself and her self-esteem. And she's found love with this man from Eastern Kentucky who came up through the foster care system, totally different from her. And she's still a nervous wreck, but she's kind of trying to get her feet under her. Uh, something goes horribly wrong. Children are put at risk. And nobody believes Colleen when she says she thinks her first husband's involved. And of course, she's lost all her confidence, so she doesn't know how to say anymore, listen to me, I, I know what I'm talking about, because everyone's like, oh, don't worry your pretty little head about it, you're fine. And the book is both about the, the, the at-risk danger, but also about her finding sort of her inner badass, if you will. And then she turns much more into like my regular characters who swear and <laughs> hit and things like that. And, and you talked a little bit about, about the, uh, Patrick McElroy, who brings sort of, you know, sort of his own scars. You know, mm -hmm. he's been in the foster care system. Tell us a little bit about, about his initial impressions of her because she comes from this sort of opposite side of the tracks kind of lifestyle. When they first meet, I thought the first sort of interaction that they had was kind of interesting. Tell us a little bit about how she sizes him up and how he views her when they first meet. It was an interesting dynamic to work with because she's very much Lexington society. And he and his partner, business partner, came up through the foster care system in eastern Kentucky. And I was lucky enough to get to work with the folks out in Rush, Kentucky at the uh, Ramey East Step Home. They were so generous letting me see the grounds and talk to their counselors. And anytime, you know, you think you know a chilling backstory, talk to somebody actually in the industry and they will tell you there's, you're not even close to the most chilling stories. But and, and anyway, they, John and Patrick, and they, they have a business together and starting out as a sort of small town movers. And when Colleen is trying to move out of her disastrous marriage house into her old family house, she doesn't want to trust anyone from her Lexington society world. So she finds these guys in like the graffiti, you know, so the free newspaper. And they meet the first time when Patrick, who is a huge man, 
is like gingerly removing broken pieces of her house, like repair, literally repairing her house. And they meet, and he's, he's so big and she's so damaged, but they have this nice dynamic of like sizing each other up. It, it, it was a really nice scene to write. I, they, were, they were an interesting couple. Their dynamic was really interesting. Because yeah. he's also got these friends who are just lunatics and drunks and, you know, just, and they kind of don't trust her. But he, he wants more than what he knew. And he sees in Colleen a chance to sort of have an, an entree into a whole different society. Yeah, and, and I love that scene because I thought that how they met for the first time was so right, so repairing interesting. Repairing the cabinet and putting her dishes away. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was the, it was the 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 normal the normalcy with the impact of the small sort of the, it, something so rudimentary as putting the cabinet together and the dishes. Ah, oh, thanks. May, may, was was really interesting. But something else happens, you know, along that storyline because you mentioned his business partner John or, mm -hmm. or Patrick's business partner John, and and they build this sort of state of the art. Um, sort of state-of-the-art home or state-of-the-art grounds or sis or place mm -hmm. for uh, at-risk youths. But something happens because one of them goes missing. Yes. Tell us a little bit uh, about about that and, and what is the fallout from when that person does go missing from that high-tech home. That's really what motivates John and Patrick together because they came up in just this brutal background. John, John less so than Patrick, but they, they swore to each other when they were kids being shuffled around through the system that if they ever had the money, they were going to build the perfect youth home. And again, I got to ask the, the counselors at Ramey East, if you could have anything in your facility, what would you want? And then it was, I couldn't write it down fast enough because it's, you know, there's a lot of kids with a lot of needs and John and Patrick address those and they keep the kids safe, high nutrition, strict rules, great grounds. But, you know, these kids have seen a lot by the time they've made it to this particular Greenfield's home and they are still kids of the system and I don't want to give too much about the book away but um, trouble tends to follow people who know nothing but trouble. Mm -hmm. So when one of the girls who is has a history of drug abuse and prostitution goes missing then the question is you know, did she just run away? Is she actually in danger? Is she playing the system or is someone actually after her? And you see how even people who know the system so well can be a little jaded and, and maybe not take the highest ground when it comes to dealing with the kids. Yeah, very interesting. We'll come back to At Risk in okay. just a minute. I wanted to go back and, and talk a little bit about the books that were written in between there, in between <laughs> oh, our first interview and the, and the one we just talked about, mm -hmm. At Risk. Two of your books that I, I really loved was The Widow File and the sequel, which was Redemption Key. Oh, thanks. Because you've got a wonderful character in there <laughs> named Danny Britton. And I, I love uh, you know, I love how you start the book at the beginning of, of Widow File where, where we see Danny sort of working, you know, in, in an office setting, maybe for a government agency doing something with high tech uh, electronics, and then everything just changes in, in the matter of minutes. Tell us a little bit about how that book begins and, and what Danny goes through when that it, that, that sort of big bombshell is dropped at the beginning of the story. The beginning of the book is an unapologetic homage to Three Days of the Condor, one of my absolute favorite movies. I, I love 70s espionage movies, love them. And it, she is working at a high-tech security firm, a surveillance firm. She's, she is as sort of low-tech, low-style as a, a, an agent could possibly be. You know, she does not hobnob with the clients. She stays in her room and is an analyst. And she comes back, she, the job has been canceled. Suddenly she goes back to get the material. And when she comes back to the compound, an assassin, a team of assassins is wiping out everybody that she works with, blowing them away. And she gets trapped in the house and has to escape and finds a, an associate who has not been killed and they escape together, which just then triggers this whole snowball effect of the, the bad guys know that Danny has a piece of information that's missing. That, that the whole reason the hit came down was because of this information she doesn't even know she has. So while she's running through the streets of D.C., being chased by this totally charming hitman that I just love, she's got a bag full of just crap on her that she has to sort through on the run and figure out what it is they're looking for. Yeah, it's great. And, and, then, oh, that, and then that doesn't, that doesn't end. Spoiler, she lives because yes. there's a sequel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Spoiler. And then that filters into Redemption Key, uh, which is takes place in Key West, Florida. Yes. So how does Danny end up from from sort of the, the high-tech 
uh, world, and, and I believe she's in and around Washington D.C. Yes. Right in yeah. in, in DC. in, in mm-hmm. D.C. in uh, Widow uh, Widow Files. So how does she end up from there down to the Florida Keys, and what follows her as she moves down there? Well, what makes her such a fun character to write is that even though she is an analyst at a high tech firm, what makes her such an effective analyst is that she is super analog. She her specialty is to look at the trash you leave in your pockets, the things you leave on your dashboard, the stuff on your nightstand, and she can tell huge secrets about you she can trace together crimes so she she is by nature very very squirrely she was also i i'm starting a trend but she was also raised uh, her father was a long distance trucker and her mother died quite young and so she was shuttled from relative to relative so she got she learned very early to keep secrets close and to keep everything she needs on her she's always got a little cash stashed away she's always got a couple of resources squirreled away she learns to rely on herself so when widow file ends and she's lost everything her job her savings everything she decides she's going to get as far away from the cold and from washington and the government as she can still in the continental united states which is of course key west which is 90 miles from cuba and if she gets down to Key West and can't make it there, but comes back a little farther into a smaller key called Redemption Key and just finds a little off-the-grid fishing camp where she works, you know, wrangling kayaks and fixing screens. But, of course, Trouble finds her. And more importantly, Booker finds her, the hitman. Mm-hmm. So then you got to read the book, see what happens there. Yeah. Spoiler, she lives, too, because there's a third one coming. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, and I, I love it, too, because... She uses a lot of the same techniques that she used to get herself out of trouble in yeah. Widow File, still in Redemption Key, but the, the colorful characters that inhabit the bar <laughs> and live in the apartment behind the bar where mm-hmm. uh, Danny Frequence really add a lot of a lot of interesting a lot yeah. of interesting dynamics to your story. That's what I like about her. She's not she doesn't use guns and, and the internet. She's not really technical. It's it's life skills that she's learned. How to read people, how to hide, how to judge and how to, you know, lie to people's face to save her own life. You know, she's she's very, very savvy and very squirrely. She was a fun character to write. She was very buttoned down, unlike a lot of my other characters that tend to be, mm-hmm. you know, like Ellie. You know, right. you know everything, Ellie Colley from Flower Town, everything she thought came right out of her mouth. It, it's not the case with Danny Britton. Yeah, she was a fun good. character. Yeah, she's a great character. So in between that, you've also written some other things. Tell us a, <laughs> a little bit things. about what else you, you worked on, some some science fiction-esque time, sort of things that came out after uh, after that. So tell us a little bit about this. Right. Well, after Flower Town came Damocles, which is, if you have one that's just a labor of love, it's very strange. It's kind of my geek book. Um, it's about, it's a first contact novel, only we are the aliens. And the whole book is just about language. It's just about this linguist from the Earth ship who meets a humanoid of another planet. A long story how they get there. But they, it, the book is basically them learning how to make a language with no social construct at all. They have no context. They, they share no context at all. And was really uh, fortifying for me because I have several friends who speak English as a second language and have learned other language who speak English and have other second languages who told me that my handling of those leaps you have to make in language, those leaps of faith, were actually very accurate. Mm-hmm. That that and that's a sort of sense of bewilderment, and then that sense of uh, ecstasy when you finally can get across a complex thought to someone in another language. How, what you know, how, what that does to the bond. So that was that was a lot of fun to write. I, I, you either love that book or you hate that book. Mm-hmm. There is no in between. Ourselves is the first of an urban fantasy series about a secret culture that lives among us. I'm actually, the second one is coming out hopefully in early spring. That's my book called The Reaches. Very bloody, very dark. It just, you know, uh, sometimes you just like to get weird. You know? <laughs> and then, um, the, what's, oh, Baggage. Actually, baggage is actually probably my favorite. Like, you know, sometimes you just, you write a book and you know, like you're at the edge of your ability level. Mm-hmm. Do, mm-hmm. do you know what I'm like? You Absolutely. always try to get there with every book, but then some books you're really like, ah, you know, you're the coyote off the edge of the cliff, and you're like, yeah. oh, please be another cliff there. Yeah. That was baggage. Yeah. I really, I went hard and went deep on that book, and it's my first book set in West Virginia, and I just, I just love it. It just, it just moved me, yeah. you know. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's, so other than that, you know, I've not been doing much. Not been doing much. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, one thing you mentioned in, in describing, um, 
at risk, going back to that, mm-hmm. about it being set up uh, or being set in, in, in Kentucky and the fact that Colleen meets Patrick, who's from eastern Kentucky. You talked about uh, – working with the people and talking with the folks at the Ramey East Step home. Mm-hmm. I know when you were working on uh, Redemption Key, you actually went oh, to yes. Key West and work, spent some work, time. Work, 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 I work. Know. So I, but I know that having fo- followed you and talked to you and, and, and read your books, that, that you feel like that part of, of writing is important. Research, reaching out, going to those places, talking to the people who maybe mm-hmm. have that, that content knowledge that maybe you don't have. Why is that important even when you're writing fiction? To, to take that step, go to those places, talk to those people that maybe have that, that base knowledge that you don't know? Because I think there's a, there's a thing about fiction. Fiction can be truer than nonfiction in a lot of ways. And if you have it set in an actual location, like some place like Lexington that's so well known, there's a, there's a vibe to it. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but there's just something about when you've been to a city and you see it with your own eyes and you hear the sound of cars going over the cobblestone streets or you see what the fountains look like or what people are talking about or dressed like in the city. It gives you an element of truth that you don't have to write, mm-hmm. but it informs your writing. Mm-hmm. And it gives your setting a bit of fact I mean, you can write without it. I have a nose. I, I have written without it. But I think it's, it's better informed with it. Like with the keys, there was just a quality to the light that I didn't know until I had been there. And I could have gotten it. You know, I could have seen the pictures and described what other people had said. But seeing how soft the light was and the way the, the uh, sea grape sounds when the wind blows through it, it, I don't think I mentioned it twice, but it adds a level of depth to your fiction. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it enriches your imagination, too, I think. Very good. So. Um, back to uh, At Risk for just a second. Uh, sure. Colleen McElroy, you write about a lot, not only with her, but in a lot of your stories, a lot of really strong female, female characters in all mm-hmm. of your books. You mentioned a little bit about sort of her socio- socioeconomic status, Colleen's, but temperament-wise, as the story gets going, how is she different and similar from maybe a Danny Britton or, or an Ellie or someone else that, that you've written one of those other other female characters and, and and how do you make those female characters different since you always since you always have that strong female in every story how do you keep those new female but characters you know, interesting and different I don't think of them as being strong female characters I think of them as being full female characters they're fully human people they're you know they're they're women who have that, that are very good at things, women who are bad at some things, women who have some damage that doesn't, they don't, you know, drag behind them like a broken leg. You know, Colleen has got a great, she's probably the most damaged, the most inhibited by her damage. Mm-hmm. But instead of, I don't, I, I hate the thought of writing an, a, a strong female character as opposed to a memorable character, someone with a lot of depth and angles and facets to them. You know, they're, they're good. You know, I, I thought Danny Britton was a really good example when uh, in Redemption Key, the, the big bad guy is trying to keep her under. He, he's like, he, you know, you're my woman. And, and she's talking to her friend Choo Choo. And she's like, should I sleep with him? And Choo Choo's like, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this isn't a lifetime movie. You, you don't actually have a lot of <laughs> leeway here. This is this. No one's going to come save you. This isn't about your virtue. You're a functioning human being and you can make questionable decisions and live with the, the consequences. So, yeah, it's fun. I, I, I don't think of it as constructing strong women. I just think of it as writing tr- the way women really are mm-hmm. with a lot of angles and secrets and truths that they hide from themselves and others sometimes. Not that I'm saying anything. <laughs> I know something else, Sheila, that you do uh, as a writer is you go to conferences. I know you've been to BoucherCon in, in Louisiana the last couple of years. I think uh, in 2017 it's going to be in Toronto. Then it goes to St. Petersburg, Florida, I think, down the road. You want to go? Um, I, I, I'd love to go. Um, <laughs> what, what does that? How does that help you as a writer, both from, you know, certainly being able to speak on panels and talk mm-hmm. about your own work, but is one side of it. What does that do for you uh, from the writing side, going to those conferences, meeting other writers, talking to readers, being on those panels? How does that help you? I'll tell you, I really encourage people to go to conferences, whatever level of writing you're at. If you're just getting started, if you're already published, if you're getting burned out, 
because what I get from them now is more than the, the panels are always interesting and you always, you, and sometimes you get to meet your heroes. You know, like I met Lawrence Block and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that was so cool. But what it really is, is you get to meet people who are in love with the same thing you're in love with. You know, you meet writers and we're weird, we're weird people. And we spend a lot of time alone. Mm -hmm. And especially thriller writers and mystery writers, we write violent, dark stuff. Yes, we do. <laughs> and then you meet, and everybody's so funny. And like it's like the least serious, least reverent group of human beings you've ever met. Because everyone's like, I got all my rage out. I killed 25 people in my last book. I'm fine. I have no stress. And it's, there's something about seeing these same people every year and, and realizing that everyone is going through the same ups and downs, the same anxieties, and you get to kind of put it down. You don't have to talk about being a writer with them because they're all like you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Sure, absolutely. And, and there are friends that you, I'm, you you make at these conferences that you see maybe two, three times a year. And I, I just wouldn't give up those friendships for anything. Yeah, that's, that's great. As we continue on, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that at the beginning of our interview that every time you write a book, it feels like you've forgotten everything that you yeah. learned from the last book. Um, what are some things uh, aside from that, that that you still find challenging about writing? Is it is it the idea creation? Is it finding time to to, to juggle the writing with having a life? Is it deadlines? What is it that you still struggle with? Uh, you feel like as a writer, a lot of it's monkey brain. You know, there's so many distractions in the world. It's funny that you would bring that for this at, at this particular interview because we were talking about off camera. This book that I'm writing now, I. I had started it. I, my mother passed away earlier in the year, and it's been a really tough year. One of those years that kind of takes you all the way down to your base level. And I really had to decide. I've, I've been having to make the decision, what kind of writer am I? What do I want? So I, I started this book, and it's a really ambitious project. And, like, I, I, I just walked away from it, about 30,000 words into it. I just, I don't know what happened, but I couldn't commit to it. So I just put it down for an entire month and then came back to it in November and fell madly in love with it. And what did it was I had a long talk with myself because I'm thinking, you know, if I get this many words done a day, I can have this done. And if I use this system, I can get that. And I thought, you know, Sheila, this is what you love more than anything else. This is your absolute favorite thing to do. And it's easy to forget that when you've got deadlines and contracts and you're promoting one book and writing another book and that you kind of get caught up in the pressure of it. So what I have to, my, my challenge for this next year is to remember that this is my favorite thing to do. I don't have to be brilliant. I don't have to be, you know, Margaret Atwood. I just have to write the story that I want to write. Mm -hmm. And that really, for me, it's that, it's that doubt and monkey brain that, gets me away from the page that I have to always find a new way to to tackle and come back to. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I know, I believe it was Toni Morrison that uh, said one time, someone asked her, you know, why did you start writing? And she said, because I wanted to read the book that I wrote. Yeah. And and, and I think sometimes as writers, no matter where you are in, on, on mm -hmm. the level, just starting out mid-list, big time, uh, you know, bestseller, whatever it might be, you, you know, we feel like we have to, you know, we have to be the next C.J. Box, or we have to be the next Stephen King, or the next Margaret Atwood, or Toni Morrison. But, but in actuality, if it's like Homer Hickam's also said, you know, I've heard him speak, and he said, you know, if you write the story that you want to read, yeah, to the best of your ability, the rest of that stuff's going to take care of itself. Because I always people like, ask me that question. I say, when you go to the library or the bookstore and you look at the shelf, what are you looking for? What's the because you know you, you when you're looking through books, what you want to find? There's always that like kind of story. And, you know, I'm trying to write the book that I'm always looking for in the bookstore. And that book changes, mm -hmm. book after book. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I had that long talk with myself. Like, I love the story I'm working on right now. And I had let myself, I'd let other people into my head and let a bunch of chatter in and anxiety and deadlines. And I thought, no, you're not going to be able to write it that way. That's not, that's not you as a writer. That's you as a professional. Mm -hmm. That you as a professional is nothing without you as a writer. You know, Absolutely. so Absolutely. that would be, if anyone's asking my, for my advice and heaven help you if you are, but that would be it. Love the writing first because mm -hmm. yeah. it's not worth it otherwise. It's too, it's too much work to do if you don't love it. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts too about, uh, about publishing? I know we didn't get a chance to ask you this uh, several years ago mm -hmm. when we interviewed you, but um, you know, traditional publishing, self-publishing, all of that. What are your thoughts on that and, and, and should writers 
go headstrong first for one avenue or another avenue or mix and match? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm making a foray into self-publishing this year with the reaches, I've decided. I, I, if I get to it, I, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I mean, I, I got lucky. I, I am inherently lazy, and I'm not very well organized. So for me to have a publisher is ideal. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be self-published, you are your own publicist, your own, ed you know, there's, or, or you have to farm out your editing, and, your, and you should farm out your editing. There's a lot of work. I think now at this point in my career, I have a little bit of an advantage because I have sort of a marketing platform already that I can build on. Mm -hmm. But I, when I talk to people who are purely self-published, they are some of the hardest working marketing geniuses I've ever known. I don't know how they do it. Mm -hmm. I think people should be honest with themselves about how much work they want to bring into it, how good they are at it. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to self-publish, you've got to be brutal about your own quality of writing. You've got to take it to people who will be cruel in their honesty. I mean, not, you don't want someone to burn your house down, but somebody who will be honest with you to make the best product you can. And I think if you're going to self-publish, you have to have a lot of material. I think, you know, backlist sells frontlist and frontlist sells backlist. So you have to, I think if you're going to self-publish, you better be ready to produce a lot. Which I do. I mean, I like I like producing. Now that I'm back in love with writing, I say that. You know, asked me a month ago, and I'd be like, No, no, I'm st I'm done. Yeah. yeah, but I think so. That's no answer at all. I have no idea. But I think there's a lot of information people should seek out, mm -hmm. and be honest. It it it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. What I, do you think? Well, I, you know, I I, I think. Turn it back to you. Yeah, Elliot. I throw it back to me. Uh, you know, I I think you're absolutely right. I think you have to be clear uh, uh, what your goals and your expectations are. You have mm -hmm. to look at your professional life versus your, your writing life. You know, a lot of us have jobs and careers and yeah. families that, you know, and we write when we can. And uh, if, if, if writing when you can is difficult, then think about if you're going to have to market your book every day and yeah. farm out an editor and, and, and the cost that's associated with that. I just think you have to be, do you have to be clear with your goals and look at, and look mm -hmm. at your, your life, your expectations and kind of see where, where all that goes. Because, um, you know, you know, I, I've had, I know some people that, that have self published that, you know, loved to write and, and, and loved writing and then hated writing by the time they got that first book self-published because they just killed themselves on the other side. You know, they, yeah. they, they had spent a lot of money financially. They had, you know, <laughs> jeopardized the family vacation. They had to take another job and, and all this kind of thing, oh, a second man. job, you know. And, yeah. and, and then they hated writing because they thought, you know, all I'm doing is trying to promote this book and I've sold, you know, five copies in a year or whatever it might be. So I, I, I but they, I don't think they really... They didn't look clear, at the wrong picture. Right. They, they didn't right. know going in. And I think that's so important. Because I, I, I got good advice the very, very beginning of my career. Somebody said, your career does not rest on one book. It's the, the, your body of work at the end of it all that is the measure of your career. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one book does well, one book doesn't do well. If you're just going, if you're going to take one title and beat it to death, it had better be Harry Potter. And even Harry Potter wasn't just one title. Right. You know, there aren't many Harry Potters out there. Yeah. So you've got to be able to put a body of work out. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's so important. So I appreciate your, your insight on that. <laughs> so, Sheila, as we finish up, uh, if someone wants to get in contact with you, they want to get a copy of At Risk, they want mm -hmm. to get a copy of Damocles, Baggage, The Widow File, Redemption Key, Flower Town, I probably missed ourselves. one. Ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, where can they, where can they first of all get copies of your books and how can they get in contact with you? Uh, anything is available on Amazon, of course, because you can get that while you're getting, you know, yoga pants and all the other things we all get on Amazon. Any bookstore, I know Empire Books and News carries my books, The Red Caboose, Huntington Museum of Art. Uh, to get hold of me, I have, sgredling at gmail.com. I'm bad. Facebook is probably the best way to reach me because, I'm, unfortunately, I spend a great deal of time on there. Okay. Um, yeah, or sgredling at yahoo.com as well. All these email addresses I don't check because I'm not good at, at – at, um, that's, that's why I don't self-publish. I'm not good at social media and, and constantly reaching out to people because I'm always writing. Mm -hmm. But Facebook, I'm on it altogether too often. Very so, good. yeah, or you can just call Elliot. If you know Elliot, just call Elliot. Yes, Elliot and I'll, I'll be happy to, to fil sure. filter you along. Yeah. Absolutely. Sheila Redling has been our guest today on Chapters. We're talking about her latest book, uh, which is called At Risk, which was released uh, uh, on September the 20th of 2016. Yes. And she is biz busy at work working on, on another book, but all of her books are outstanding. Oh, uh, she, she, she's a terrific writer and, and someone who. Uh, 
inspires me a great deal as a writer, but also is very approachable. So when she says contact her on Facebook, she really means it because yeah, I'm she, super she aloof, much, as you can see. She <laughs> very she very much is is always interested to give feedback and advice. So Sheila, congratulations uh, uh, on At Risk. It's a great book, and we look forward to uh, talking with you more as you keep writing more books. And we promise it won't be three years between times we had Good. you back on. I won't be three years for my next book either. That's <laughs> really frightening. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. Appreciate it. And we also want to take a moment to uh, thank uh, Chris Dargish and the staff and management of Empire Books and News for providing our on-site support and assistance today. We encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News to pick up copies of Sheila Redling's books or check out any of the other books that you've seen featured here on the program. They're for sale and available right here at Empire Books and News. So we appreciate you stopping to appreciate uh, their support and, we, and they would appreciate you stopping by and talking with them uh, about those books or any other reading tastes that you need satisfied. All that can be taken care of right here at Empire Books and News. And if you are a fan of social media we've got a variety of platforms that are available and have made it possible for you to reach out to us here on the program the first is our email address that's lp4 at zoominternet.net and that is appearing right here at the bottom of the screen we do ask if you email us that you let us know your name and the place that you are writing from so that we can keep track of that if you're a youtube viewer we have an armstrong one wire page a chapters tab and a chapters page through the armstrong one wire page on youtube and that address is right here at the bottom of the screen it's www.youtube.com back slash Armstrong One Wire. From there, click on the Chapters tab, and we've got all of our episodes archived for you there. So you can go back and watch them uh, multiple times and also leave comments in the comments fields. And we know many of you have done that, and we appreciate that so much. If you're a user of Facebook, we also have a Chapters page on Facebook. All you need to do is go to Facebook.com. In the search field, type Chapters. And our most recent episodes of the program are placed there for you as well. And just like with the YouTube channel, you can go in and profile uh, those interviews, watch them again, and also comment and interact with other viewers of the program as well. So whatever social media platform you like to use, we've made it possible for you to stay in touch with the program and stay on top of what's going on here on Chapters. And we know many of you have accessed those, and we appreciate that so much. So please keep utilizing those, and please keep the feedback coming. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.